I got paid 60 grand after taxes. <laughs> and I remember the first match I ever got paid for in professional wrestling was like 25 bucks. So I go from making $60,000 a week to $25. He is the man himself, Moose. So good to see you again. Right here. What what are we eating here, by the way? I have some skinny props. Well, you, I mean, but you are the opposite of skinny these days. <laughs> when I saw you last, it was about a month ago. I'm like, man, you've gotten huge, and you're like, no, everyone keeps saying that to me. I'm not huge. I've lost all this weight. I remember that. I was like, yeah, I've lost like 50 pounds, but everybody keeps saying I'm huge. Well, you're like your body fat is definitely in the single digits now. Like you're looking more jacked than ever. Yeah, that's I, honestly. I need to find a place that could where I can get my body fat checked because I will, I really want to know everybody. I, like I, the guy that helps me out, AJ Sims, the yeah. buddy in my life. I was like, hey, what do you think my body fat is? And just by looking at him, he'll be like um, between eight to ten. But we don't know. He's just going by looking at me right it's not really any valid source of checking what it is you know i don't know when you look at that guy's instagram and i think we should give him a shout out it's is it cement yeah. factory shout out to cement factory aj Sims, because without him i i wouldn't look and be where i am right now and so. I mean, all of the guys that he's gotten into incredible shape, we're talking like EC3 and Drake Maverick oh. and uh, Jackson Riker, awesome Apollo job. Cruz. Apollo Cruz, yeah. I hey. mean, yeah, he knows his stuff, man. He, he literally knows his stuff. I mean, I remember when I first started, and it could get very addictive too, because it's like one of those things like, um, when you're trying to lose weight on getting in shape, like yeah. a lot of times, like it's very, very, very hard because yeah. of what you what he has you eating. But um, the diet he has is on is like you, you eat a lot. Actually, it's like obviously you're not eating a burger and fries and pizza and all that, but it's actually healthy food. But you're actually eating a lot of it because you have to yeah. eat like five a day, depending on the day. Yeah. Do you have your actually, TV on, by the way? Could you turn your TV off? Oh yeah, yeah, I'm sorry. No, I no, literally... it's okay. I'm sure it's. I'm sure whatever you're watching is great. Maybe you're scouting for your Bound for Glory match right now. Literally, like it's weird. I'm I'm such a weirdo because all I watch on TV is sports channels. So, like for instance, it'll, my my TV will be on FS1 or ESPN literally all day, <laughs> and I watch all the talk show sports channels. Like, because yeah. honestly, that's something. I always tell my wife, I'm like, man, this is something I want. I kind of want to do. I kind of want to have my own sports show and debate with people all day because I'm really big into sports. Well, I mean, maybe after your wrestling career, maybe that's what you'd end up doing. Yeah, maybe we'll see. And maybe you know, maybe sometime in ten or twenty years, that's that's your new job. Yeah, uh, I'll bring you on and we'll debate about about some sports. Okay, it's done. Are you a big sports guy? I am big sports guy. I mean, I obviously didn't play it at the level that you did, but grew up playing baseball, hockey, of course, because I grew up in Canada. I was an amateur wrestler. I played a ton of sports. What's your go-to sport? To watch? Now it's football. Football, oh. And I uh, am a... I am a Browns fan, which up until about last season was super embarrassing to admit. Yeah, like, I mean, they went to the playoffs last year. Like, I mean, that's good. I mean, I, I think they're, what, they're two and two this year, maybe? Two and three? I think they're three and two now, yeah. That's what it is, yeah. I, I, it's kind of weird because I don't watch, really watch a lot of football. Oh, like, so what's your go-to sport now? I'm a big basketball guy. Ah. Like, Actually, I'll take that back. I'm not really a Lakers fan. I'm a big Westbrook fan. So whatever team he goes to is who I generally follow. Yeah, fair enough. Did, yeah. did playing football make you not like football as much? No, I, uh, I never was a big football guy. Like, even playing, I never really was a football guy. It was just one thing that I luckily was good at. But um, as a kid, I it's funny, funny story is, like, when I – got drafted by the Falcons in 2006. I remember first day of the building, I ran into Warwick Dunn. 
And stupid me, I didn't even know who Warwick Dunn was. <laughs> I didn't watch football. So I remember meeting my me and I was like, hey, my name is Quinn Ojanaka. What's yours? And he probably looked at me like, you freaking serious? I'm freaking Warwick Dunn. It's like, that's kind of, and, and for the people who don't know who Warwick Dunn, that's kind of like, like me and who would you say, um, Sting, like, yeah. and not know who Sting is. And it's like, hey, my name is so and so. Um, what's yours? And it's like, I'm freaking Sting. That's equivalent to me and the work done, you know. So, right. Well, right. I, I didn't watch football at all. Like, I, I mean, I just luckily was good at it. Did Did basketball ever cross into your world? Is something you thought you might have played? Yeah, I actually played. I remember me and a couple of my friends, we tried out for our varsity team in basketball. Um, I want to say it was a sophomore, junior year. I remember the coach, we getting cut like the second day. And the coach telling me like, um, maybe you want to stick to football. Like, you know what I'm saying? It's just one of those things I did sports because it was a way to hang out with my friends. Um, um, I came from a strict, strict, um, parenting background where my mom we lived in a kind of like a rough neighborhood so the only time I could really hang out with my friends was after school activities which would either be sports or sorry to say detention um and I didn't get I mean obviously he wants to get in trouble just so they can hang out with the kids so I chose the more positive aspect of it which was sports so and all my friends played football so I decided to play football too so growing up in a rough area, did you start to, when you were getting good at football, did you start to see this as, oh, if I get really good, I can get out of this town? Um, no, I honestly, that really didn't cross my mind at all. It was just, um, I didn't really think about that aspect of it until when I was in college. Um, for me, it was always like, okay, I'll play football, hang out with my friends. And then it was one of those things, like I got a football scholarship. And as a guy who didn't really care much for football, I, I got to go to school for free. So what kid would tell their parents or to tell their mom, be like, hey, uh, I don't like football, so I'm going to turn down this scholarship. I mean, what kid would do that, you know? Yeah. So um, I get to go to school for free. I get, honestly, I get to go to college for free. Um, so when I was in college, I remember my junior year, after the end of my junior year, uh, me receiving a lot of phone calls from agents um and honestly it didn't really even hit me how good I was like in football I just thought there was something that was normal that the end of your junior year going into your senior year or agents are going to start hitting you up with the possibility about going to the NFL yeah. but it was one of those things where every agent that hit me up would be like oh so after this year like uh, if you was to come out next year, I mean, if you come out next year, you could be a third round draft pick. And every agent that I spoke to literally pretty much said the same thing. Some of them said third round, some of them said second round, some of them said fifth round, like sixth round. But every all the agents I spoke to said that I was going to get drafted. And that's when it hit me was like, man, I know I always want to be a professional wrestler, but if I get, if I could be rich like you know what i'm saying like, i don't know what wrestlers make but i know what the first round of a nfl draft pick make uh, yeah. or the second round of, of a nfl draft pick make i know how much money these guys make so yeah. my plans kind of like got derailed a little bit you know it's not like you went to just any school either you went to a pretty great school you went to syracuse university yeah. right yeah so you, I mean, you've got a lot of eyeballs on you there because you're going to a good school, which I imagine is going to help you as a prospect in the NFL. Right. Yeah. So it's like, that's when I started thinking about, that's why I really started uh, taking football serious. And I was like, man, I need to have a really good senior year because I have all these agents calling me and um, there's a chance I could get drafted here. Like, and not only get drafted, there's a chance I could get drafted high. You know, so that's when I really, really took, that was the only time my whole life of playing football where I actually took rest, I mean, football serious, where I started grinding and doing the extra work and working on my speed and doing the extra stuff after practice, you know. So, I mean, you, you're great in high school with the goal of, I want to get a scholarship. 
then you get the scholarship with the goal of maybe I want to be good enough to get drafted in the NFL. Where does it go from there? You get drafted in the NFL. What does the new uh, goal become? Oh, uh, I get drafted in the NFL. Uh, honestly, there wasn't really any goal. I was like, I was making a lot of money. Uh, um, I, I was a kid who came from nothing, making literally half a million dollars a year for the first few years, three, four years in the, um, in the NFL. So it was like, I really didn't have a goal. I had, I was set, you know. I'll be honest, I wasn't really thinking about when am I going to enter this wrestling journey because to me, it was only about how much money can I make at this level. Like, I get to buy things I, I only dream of having as a kid, um, different cars and different clothes and different jewelry and buy big houses. And it was like, so life was great. Yeah. But it comes to a time when you're making all this money, but you're really not happy with what you're doing. You know what I'm saying? So, um, and that, that after I left Atlanta, after I got traded away from Atlanta, that's when it kind of struck. Where I was like, look, I've, I've made this sh- oh, crap load of money. Um, I have all this jewelry. I have all these clothes. I have all these shoes. I have all these cars. But I'm really not really happy because football is not what I set out to do. You know what I'm saying? Like, it's like right now I'm pretty much living a lie because I'm not happy with what I'm doing. I'm just happy with what what I'm doing right now, like the money it's given me. Yeah. So it, it got to a point where after my seventh year, I was like, you know, I have to give. It was one of those things when you're not happy doing something, it definitely shows. Mm. Um, the way you play, you know, my, my play started going down. I started playing really bad and, it was one of those things where I was so stressed out. I wasn't play, playing too well, um, and, but I didn't care, you know, because it's like I didn't really enjoy what I was doing. So I didn't care how bad I was playing because um, the paycheck was still coming, but still I didn't want to do it. I, I didn't know when would be a good time to to let it go, to start to – start this journey of what I really want to do. So um, long story short, I got released in 2012, about November, December 2012, and had an opportunity to go play for other teams, but I turned it all down to, to start this journey of pro wrestling. And the crazy thing about starting your journey in pro wrestling is now you've got to start at the bottom. Right. <laughs> yeah. So it's like, yeah, you go from, I remember the last paycheck I got from the Rams because we get paid every Tuesday, I believe, out of Tuesday or Wednesday, every Wednesday. Okay. Every, I remember the last page I got before I got released was like $60,000. Oh, and that's after taxes. So it's like, I got paid 60 grand after taxes. <laughs> and I remember the first match I ever got paid for in professional wrestling was like 25 bucks. So I go from making Sixty thousand dollars a week to twenty five dollars. <laughs> so it's like, but it didn't really matter because it was like I loved what I was doing. It was like, yeah. and that's what I'm saying. The first time I got paid, I did a bunch of shows for free that I just had to drive up, and as long as I drove up and they would give me a spot on the car. But the first time I actually got paid was $25. <laughs> so those other shows were actually costing you money. <laughs> yeah, it was actually costing me not only money, but time. Because like I remember I drove, one time I did a, I did a show in Dreamwave. Um, I think it was Dreamwave in, in Chicago, Illinois. And I remember, I forgot the guy's name. He told me as long as I would get there, he would give me a spot on the show. So I drove... And I had the money to, to buy my own flight to fly to Chicago and on the South, wherever the heck it was in Chicago. But to me, I was like, you know what? This is what wrestlers do. So I kind of want to to do what wrestlers do. So I, yeah. I bought, uh, I remember a month before that, I bought a, um, not a, electric, a hybrid car, a tiny hybrid car. Pay for it cash. I think it was like $18,000. Pay for it cash because it was great on mileage. And this was going to be my road trip car. <laughs> so I remember I took this car and I drove, at the time I was living in Atlanta, I drove 12 hours to Dream, to LaSalle, Illinois, wrestling in Dreamwave. I forget who my opponent was um, that night. 
And I was so stoked. The guy did get me a hotel because obviously it was a 12 hour drive. He got me a hotel, but I was so stoked that I actually wrestled in this hot show. And at the time, Dreamway was a real hot promotion. Uh, probably had like three, 400 people there in a small building and it was actually hot, you know what I'm saying? So I was really excited. I, I still had the momentum from wrestling this match. I was like, you know what? I'm not going to take the whole time. I'm just going to drive back. <laughs> so I drove back. So I drove 12, 12 hours, wrestled 12 minutes maybe. And after the match, drove 12 hours home, you know what I'm saying? Which in my mind, I'm thinking about, I was like, what the hell was I think was I thinking about? Like, I drove 24 hours just to wrestle for free for 12 minutes. <laughs> like, <Man. laughs> Where did the real love for pro wrestling and wanting to be a pro wrestler begin? Um, as a kid, I mean, just like with everybody as a kid. Um, I, as a kid, I was a huge wrestling fan. Like, uh, I, I watched everything, like WWE, WW, um, WCW, ECW. I watched everything. Uh, Everything that was in TV, I'm not gonna lie. I didn't know as a kid. I didn't know there was such things as, um, like New Japan and um, other wrestling companies or indie companies. I didn't know that was a thing. I was just into the big three that was on TV, which at the time was WWE for the longest, and then WCW came around, and then ECW came around later. So, yeah. And then when did you decide? All right, I'm gonna. Did you choose football over wrestling simply because it was the free education and then a chance to make some money? Yeah, pretty much. That was it. 100. percent it. And was there any point during your NFL career where you were like, maybe this wrestling thing is never going to happen? Um, honestly, I didn't really think about that when I was playing football. Um, I didn't really think about when am I going to start wrestling? I was just enjoying the money I was making. Um, I still did watch wrestling righteously every time it came on. In fact, it got to the point where I, I had enough money where I made it like a, kind of like a routine where me and some of my friends or, um, from high school who, um, who loved wrestling as much as I did would fly to wherever the WrestleMania site is, or we'll get a hotel, we'll make a weekend out of it, and then we'll go to WrestleMania. So I did, every year I did that. There and is no- I was in the NFL, WrestleMania always lined up during the off season. Right. So I, I could do it, you know what I'm saying? I actually could do it. I, I wasn't missing anything because it was April, and April was off season because the Super Bowl was what? February, so yeah. we didn't yeah. have to get back to work until late May to start OTAs or whatever. So every year it was like a thing with me and three, four of the guys, buddies, teammates would fly to wherever WrestleMania was. And There's no better image than a man the size of you petting a cat right now. <laughs> <laughs> Who is, who's that cat that was just here? What's, their, what's his or her name? Elope, we call her Peep. And then we've got a, is this a dog right next to you? Yeah, this is a dog. <laughs> and we got a moose. So we got, we got all these animals here. When, when did, what was the first time that someone called you moose? Uh, Michael Vick actually gave me, gave me the name my rookie year. So it, it stems from all the way from my rookie year when I was in Atlanta. So Michael Vick gave it to you just because of the way that you played? No, he said there was a guy that, that was called Moose a few years before I got there, and I guess I looked like him, so that's why I, that's how I got the name Moose. And I remember you telling me in our last interview, which man, I can't believe it was years ago, you hated the nickname. I hated it, yeah. Like, you know, and it was one of those things that I, I actually wanted to be called Tank because in high school, everybody called me Tank. So, but there's a rule in the NFL you don't get to pick your nickname. Oh, um, that's, that's the rule. So that was a rule. That was the name that was given to me. And I just stuck with me. I think that's just a rule in life. You can't give yourself a nickname. Yeah, I know, right? Yeah. So it did. So the name obviously stuck. Then what part of you went? All right, this is going to be my wrestling name. Then. Um, it was just in when I was in training. Um, 
with Mr. Hughes, um, cause we will do this Thursday night free show for the fans. And um, that's when you would train for a while. And if he thought you was good enough, he will book you on the free Thursday night shows at the same school. And some of the town, some of the local fans that live like in a five minute radius from the school would come to the school. So we usually, we used to have at least about 30 people in this tiny building. Like it was, this building was so tiny and small that 30 people made it feel like WrestleMania, you know? <laughs> so um, I remember when he told me, yeah, you're gonna, I'm gonna book you for a match Thursday. Um, think of a name. In my mind, I was like, man, what can I call myself? Like, and, and I sat there for hours thinking about what my name would be. And I forgot who told me. It was like, how about you just go with Moose? Like, that's what everybody called you. And it was like, and all the wrestlers at the time called me Moose. And you know what I'm saying? So it was like, oh, yeah, maybe that's easy. Yeah, like, it's very easy. Um, and I had a teammate that I played with. His name was Lawyer Malloy. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with him, but um, he was a big time Patriots and I played with him with the Falcons. And every time he got introduced when they did the, so you know in the NFL before the games, a lot of people don't know this, but before the games in the NFL, they were either introduce, the home team will either introduce the starting offense or the starting defense. And you yeah. get the perks and all that stuff with each person coming down. So Lawyer Malloy, every time, they introduced him, he would do this thing right here. And it would get a huge reaction for some reason. So I kept that in my back, my back pocket as man, when I've, if I ever do become a wrestler, there's something towards that haunt the haunting that Lawyer Malloy does, and everybody does it with them when they introduce him. So at that moment that when I was thinking about what I was gonna do for an entrance, I was like, maybe if I said moose and did this as I said moose. Maybe the people would do it. So um, I had a buddy at the time. He was uh, he made music, and I told him I was like, "Hey, um, can you make me an entrance music, an entrance song? I have a, a match at my school, and I need an entrance music for it." And he was like, "So what do you want?" And I was like, "I just wanted to say moose the whole time." And he was like, "Are you sure?" I was like, "Yeah, I just wanted to say moose the whole time." And he was like, "Okay, cool." And that's where my entrance music. Um, came from and it actually got over because I came out, the song was saying Moose, I was doing this whole thing the 25, 30 people in the school was saying Moose and that's how the Moose on pump and became a thing. And that's become like such a big thing like you're, big. you're so over because of that song. Yeah. So w was that really the first thing in your career like the first step where you're like alright this is my first break uh, but then when, what's the next break after that? I don't think it was really my first break because I didn't really think when I did that song, when I came out to that song in the school and um, WWA4, I'm not thinking big picture yet. I'm not thinking, man, I'm going to be this over professional wrestler. I'm going to be as popular as I am now. I'm just thinking... Man, I'm excited to wrestle on this free show on Thursday because this is my first match ever. And I'm rest I get to wrestle for seven minutes against this dude named Axel Ross. Um, uh, which Axel Ross, um, he was like the head train, he was one of the trainers at the Curtis Hughes school. So the days Curtis Hughes felt lazy and didn't want to train anybody, Axel Ross would take over the class pretty much. So I got to wrestle him. So I'm not thinking about man, this is going to skyrocket my my career. I'm just thinking, man, I'm nervous as hell. This is my first match. I have seven minutes. Let me not screw this up. Um, when I started thinking big picture was when me and a couple of buddies who also wrestled at the school, um, one of them wrestled at the school, and he, he had a tag partner that lived in North Carolina. And um, we were all pretty close they hit me up and was like, hey man, this is Ring of Honor tryout in Philadelphia. Um, actually, no, I'll take that back. Apollo Cruz, good friend of mine. Um, he wrestled at Uha Nation at the time. He hit me up and um, he was like, hey, I'm, I, I, I 
currently do shows with this company called Dragon Gate USA slash Evolve. Um, I think he was signed there. Maybe he was, maybe he wasn't. But he hit me up and was like, hey, I'm going to be um, driving to Tampa, wherever, Triple Shot Weekend. Um, for people who don't know what a triple shot is, is when you have a show in one city. Um, if you have three, if you have a show all weekend, Friday, Saturday, Saturday, Sunday, it's called a triple shot. So he was like, yeah, I have a triple shot. Um, I'm getting picked up by somebody and we're driving to Tampa. We're going to do a show in Tampa Friday, a show in Orlando Saturday, and a show in Jacksonville Sunday. And he was like, I think you should come because you're athletic or whatever. And you know what I'm saying? You're pretty athletic. You're still green as hell, but you're pretty athletic. He was like, I think you should call There's a guy there named Gabe, and he's the booker for Evolve slash um, Dragon Gate. So I was like, oh, yeah, sure. I, I have nothing going on. Like, I'll definitely come. So I jump in the car with him. Um, I think the Bravado Brothers was one of the guys around the car. I think one of them wrestles for NXT right now. Um, he's the one that wears a Chase U University sweater or whatever. He was the guy that was driving. So we go to, um, we get to Dragon, Dragon Gate USA and Gabe sees me. Uha puts, puts in a good word for, in, to Gabe for me. So Gabe was like, okay, cool. I'll give you a, a practice match. Um, didn't get to use my music, just with me coming out there. In fact, they gave me generic music. So wasn't still wasn't thinking big picture yet. So, um, I come out, I, I was like, okay, I don't have my music. I'm just going to say moose and do my arm pump thing. Yeah, yeah. As I'm doing it, people are looking at me like, what the heck is this that I'm doing? So quiet. And trust me, it was, a, it was a packed house too. It was probably like 200 people at the, and I forgot the name of the, the spot in Tampa, the Orpheum, I think it was, in Tampa. 200 people and they're dead quiet. And it's just me, this big black guy chanting his own name in his entrance moose 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 and everybody's just like okay what is this guy talking about and it was so funny because by the end of the match the tryout match that i had all 200 people started chanting moose moose <laughs> so crazy but i didn't think nothing of it so did those shows for free because it was just tryout matches didn't get paid for it did all those shows for free wrestled or whatever and then like a couple of weeks after I did it, I, um, Gabe told me, he was like, yeah, every time we have a show, make come to the show and um, I'm not gonna pay you, but I'm gonna have a spot for you. So that's where the connection started coming. Okay, I get to work for Dragon Gate USA and um, I'm not gonna get paid, but I'm gonna do the show. So I end up not signing the deal, but a verbal agreement working with Gabe with Dragon Gate USA. And I remember after one of the weekends we did a show with, he offered me a contract, which the contract was probably like a three-year deal or whatever, but I was only going to be making like 75 bucks uh, a show. It wasn't even that much. It was maybe 50 bucks a show. In my mind, I was like, why would I sign a three-year deal only making $50? That doesn't make sense. Yeah. So I Gabe, I was like, hey, man, I don't know if I want to sign a deal. Let's just keep it as what we have, the working relationship. But just still pay me the $50. I'll take the $50. But I don't want to sign any contract. But I will happily take $50 a show. And he was like, okay, cool. So we had to work an agreement, which I agreed to getting paid $50, 50 to 75 a show, whatever it was. Um, so a couple of weeks after that agreement I had with Gabe, um, a buddy of mine, um, that I trained with told me about the Ring of Honor camp that was coming up. And he was like, man, Ring of Honor is hot. And I knew about Ring of Honor because at this point, when I started training to become a professional wrestler, I actually heard about Ring of Honor. I started watching Ring of Honor. It was so different than anything else. It was so different than TNA and it was so different from WWE. And um, it was just a different style of wrestling. It was kind of more of a... Uh, young school type of wrestling where people did a lot of crazy stuff and I was a huge fan of that. It reminded me like ECW. So I was like, oh, hell yeah, I will go do Ring of Honor and do the trial. So we took a mega bus, we bought mega, mega bus tickets. And once again, 
I could afford to just fly to Philadelphia, but my friends didn't have that kind of money. So I was like, you know what? I'll do whatever you guys do. So we all paid, I want to say like 20 bucks for round trip mega bucks tickets from Atlanta to Philadelphia, which was the most miserable ride I've ever had in my life. But once again, it was fun because I was going with my my boys and we was all going to do something we all loved, which was professional wrestling. So I remember we doing the tryout. Um, and at the end of the tryout, what Ring of Honor typically do, they will pick a few guys and they'll have have them have um, practice matches. So I had a practice match with this guy named um, Wild Man Kong. Oh, I think that was his name, or Congo Kong, or whatever it is. I remember Jay Lethal being there, and the Briscoe Brothers, um, Truth Martini, um, Hunter was there. And I remember doing this match, everybody just popping and going crazy. And, and all these guys I just mentioned, all these legends in my eyes, just met, met guys I see on TV and I was a big fan of, especially Jay Lethal, which I was a huge fan of Jay Lethal because of his stuff in TNA, you know what I'm saying? With the whole classic war off with Ric Flair. So I was a big yeah. part of Jay Lethal and I'm seeing him, he's going crazy over my match with Wild Man Congo or whatever. So after the match, they pulled me to the room that was like, hey, look, man, you freaking killed it. Um, we don't have any spots to sign you right now, but man, if you come to our show, if you find a way to make it to our show, we'll definitely give you a dark match and we'll have something, we'll try to get something for you. So I was like, oh man, this is, I have a chance to possibly work for Ring of Honor. So I made it a thing to go online, find their schedule of all the shows that they have, print it out. And at this point I was like, okay, I have enough money to fly myself to whatever shows they're at. So whatever shows that, that the, the ticket wasn't too expensive. I would buy a flight, buy a hotel room, go to the show, help out with the ring, help out with picking some of the boys up, um, help out with like picking up Steen and Adam Cole and all these guys from the airport, do whatever I can. And every time they paid me back by putting, giving me a dark match. Still, I couldn't use my, on all these dark matches we talked about, I could still couldn't use my music. I would just use my generalized music that they gave me with the most thing. So I was just going off talent at this point. So I remember when, um, I forgot who told me this, but there was like, maybe you need to tell Hunter that um, Dragon Gate, cause I was doing both at the time. I would go to Ring of Honor, get a dark match or whatever they could offer me. And then I would go work and get paid $50 for um, Dragon Gate USA Evolve. So I had those two shows in my back pocket. And then as you know, professional wrestling, when indie promoters see that you're working with Dragon Gate USA and you're working also doing dark matches for Ring of Honor, they think, oh man, this guy's good enough to get attention from both his places and start sure. booking. So I was getting a lot of bookings too, not making a lot of money. Probably at the most at this time, I was probably getting paid like 80 bucks in the indies. Um, so I forgot who told me this. So I was like, man, then um, Dragon Gate offer you a contract? I was like, yeah, it wasn't a good contract. It was a crappy contract. And he was like, well, you have leverage. And I was like, I didn't, I, I, I understood what they was talking about, but I didn't really understand what they was talking about. They was like, maybe you need to hit up, you need to, next time you go to Ring of Honor, let them know that Dragon Gate offered you a contract. Don't yeah. tell them contract was but just tell them that they offered you a contract. So I was like, actually, I'm going to do that. Uh, so the la the next show I did, I, I grabbed Hunter, pulled him aside and told him, I was like, hey, Hunter, um, Gabe offered me a contract. And he was like, you didn't sign it, did you? And I was like, um, no, I mean, it wasn't the best contract, but he, I'm thinking about doing it. He was like, no, 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 don't sign it. Give me a week and we'll present something to you. So I was like, okay, cool. Literally a week later, they presented me with a contract, um, which the contract wasn't that great, but it was like, to me, it was like I was watching Ring of Honor. Like when I left the NFL, Ring of Honor was like the first non WWE. TNA TV company that I knew about and I was watching it and I was a big fan of a lot of the wrestlers on the show. Yeah. So 
first contract Ring of Honor offered me, and I don't care because I mean, to me, money is not a thing. It was a one year deal making a hundred and twenty five dollars a show, and to me, that was like a million dollars. Like just coming from a guy who was making sixty thousand dollars a week, getting offered a contract to wrestle for a hundred and twenty five dollars a show, you know what I'm saying? And I remember when they made my debut, they were looking for music to use. And I was like, I have a music, just try it out. Then we'll tell me what you think. And I gave it to her and Hunter fell in love with it. He was like, are you serious? This is your song, this is badass. And I remember with the first match, debut match I had, I wrestled Hakeem Zane, which is Rohit at, mm-hmm. at Impact right now. And as soon as that music came on, the whole arena went ape shit. And I didn't have to do the moose thing. They'll remember, because they all remembered me when this dark match is doing this. And now they can hear the music that was pretty much telling them what to do when I did this and the whole place went crazy. And I mean, I know it's a long story, but. Now I love this. And what, what I think is great, what's at the heart of this story is You keep mentioning you had money, you had the money to fly yourself and you didn't want to, like you wanted to do this, the, I guess, right way or the way where it felt like you were earning it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That was it. Uh, I, 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 I think coming from the, a football background helped me in that aspect because I know in football as a rookie, you always want to prove yourself. And I knew if I didn't do it the right way, and with wrestling, everybody I was going to have that stigma that, oh, he only went came this far because he's an ex-football player, blah, 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 blah. So I already knew that in my – I had that mindset. I already knew what people was going to say if I didn't do it the right way. So I erased that right away by making the long road trips, driving as, everywhere I could drive and, you know what I'm saying, doing shows for free and – fly myself to every ring of honor show without getting a dime for it you know and people don't realize this i did the tryout with ring of honor i want to say in 2013 maybe like i want to say it was november 2013 and i got signed with ring of honor in july of 2014 so it was almost a full year of me flying myself to different rent ring of honor shows and helping out and setting up the ring and doing airport rides and picking the boys up and getting the boys food and taking them to go get food or whatever kind of needed me to do at this point you know what i'm saying before i got signed so yeah i i did my young boy my young boy stuff for for about almost a year man then how did you get on impact wrestling's radar I don't know how I got on Impact Wrestling's radio. That's the funny thing about it. Is, um, I remember I signed my first deal with Ring of Honor, which was, like I told you, one year deal in July for making 125 a show, which was nothing. Um, and then my deal, my contract was up, and they offered me, uh, they offered me a, like a salary to set going to my second year, which wasn't really much. It was probably like 20 grand, maybe. Which to me, like I said. I got to do what I love doing. And they were using me right. And I was wrestling some of the best wrestlers in the world, which I kind of used as a learning curve because I would get to wrestle Jay Briscoe. I would get to wrestle Adam Cole. I would get to wrestle Roderick Strong. I would get to tag with AJ Styles. Like I was wrestling all these great wrestlers, you know what I'm saying? And most of these wrestlers now are working in New York or working in AEW making boatloads of money and you know what I'm saying and these were guys that I was working with on a weekly basis in Ring of Honor because we were running like pretty much every week or every other week or something like that you know what I'm saying yeah. so um so yeah I signed a second contract I remember um once my second contract was up I got a call from or once my second contract was it was like a month out from my second contract with Ring of Honor to being up and I knew I was getting there in wrestling because I got an email from WWE and um, it was Canyon Seaman. Um, and he was like, Hey man, I know you did a tryout with us a couple of years ago and you had your situation with um, 
injury or whatever because i actually did a tryout with wwe before i even started went to wrestling school mm. and i didn't know what the hell i was doing i have never taken a bump um i, I got this tryout because my teammate james laurinitis his dad is um rest in peace um animal um and his uncle is john laurinitis for wwe so he got me a tryout with wwe like after I was done with football. Mm. And during that tryout, I, I hit my head on the ground doing a headlock takeover and kind of got like real loopy or whatever. Um, so that happened. So I remember um, after when my deal with Ring of Honor was coming up, my second year, my second deal with Ring of Honor was coming up, they hitting me up and asking me um, if I was interested in coming in to doing another tryout. Um, which I was like, heck yeah, it's always been a dream of mine to work for WWE. Why wouldn't I be willing to do it? So I remember doing the tryout and they told, telling me that, hey man, like, we really like you, but the only thing we have to offer you is a spot on Tough Enough, I believe it was. And for me, I was in a position where Moose was a household, I, at least I felt like Moose was a household name or Moose was going to be a household name that I wouldn't want to stop everything that I've built in Moose, which it wasn't much because we're only, we're talking about Ring of Honor here. It's not like I was in New Japan or like Impact Wrestling at the point, at the time. And it was like, so I didn't want to start afresh with doing Tough Enough and going in there as probably, I don't know if they give you a fake name or that you get the usual real name. I don't know how that works, but- You'd Probably just be Quinn. Yeah. yeah, I didn't want to do that. So I was like, no, nah, I think I was just, um, stick with what I was doing there. After that, I remember once my deal was coming up, I remember um, well, it was maybe a week before my deal was, and I was set to sign back with Ring of Honor, and, and um, I forgot the guy who was working with Impact Wrestling at the time. I can't think what his name is. Um, it wasn't Biggs. It was, um, yeah, I think it was. I think it was John Gaborik. I remember him hitting me up and was like, hey, we want you to bring you in and we'll pay you this much money if you come in. And to me, I was like, are you serious? Because it was like four or five times more than what, impact, like three times more than what Impact offered me for my third contract. So I was like, Impact Wrestling is awesome because I remember watching all these epic matches with- Oh, there's so much history it, there. Yeah, it was TNA at the time. It wasn't, we hadn't switched over to TNA to Impact Wrestling yet. It was still TNA. And I remember watching all these great matches with TNA. And um, to me, I, I really only looked at Ring of Honor as like, uh, and I'm, I'm not trying, it's, I don't mean this by any disrespect. At that point, I only saw Ring of Honor as a big name indie that happened to be on TV. But I saw TNA as an actual wrestling company, you know what I'm saying? Because of all the history it had. I mean, at one point they had Hogan, they had um Sting. Jeff Carroll was there, Sting was there, Kurt yeah. Angle was there. Like, so to me, this was my chance to, okay, it's time to go play with the big boys, you know what I'm saying? I, I've learned Ring of Honor has taught me what I think I, I need, yeah. but now I have to actually take that next step. And so I came, I join and join tna which is now impact wrestling well and now you're one of the big boys there like you can't think of impact wrestling now without thinking about moves yeah i mean it's, it's, and that's one thing i pride myself man. um I, I i worked so hard to to make that a thing you know and um people ask me why did i sign back with impact wrestling um and it's like it's easy because um i want to show people that um that WWE is not the end all be all. Like, yeah, if you want, if you care, if all you do is care about making a tons of money, then go there. You, um, it's most times it's said that you're probably not going to be happy there. Um, but everybody has a different experience. But um, but there's a lot of things I've set aside and impact that I and goals I've set aside to kind of hit that I haven't really hit yet, and I want to be one of the guys that in two years from now, when impact is up here, they could be like most help impact get up there. Mm -hmm. Eric Young, Eddie Edwards, Josh Alexander, um, 
Dion and Peraza, all these guys that we have in our roster now busting their ass help impact get to the stage of this yet because I don't think we're there yet. Uh, like, I don't think we're near, nowhere there. But I do think in a couple of years we're going to be up there where we used to be 10 years ago when it was TNA, yes. I, I love when you brought back the TNA World Championship. Yeah. Because I've been a I've been a TNA fan and Impact fan pretty much since the beginning, so bringing that belt back was like such a big nostalgia factor for me. Was that your idea to bring that back? Um, I wish I could take credit for that, but no, uh, we do have a writing team, uh, a great writing team as as well with Jimmy Jacobs and Robert Evans and um, Tommy Dreamer and Scott Demore that pretty much write the whole show. And it, it was pretty much our idea. When they presented it to me, I loved it. I thought it was a, a great idea because it took me back to when um, Ric Flair went back to WWE and he had the NWA title and he was telling people that he's a real world champion. And people was like, look at that. And what the hell is that title you have on your waist? You didn't win that here. So it kind of gave me that same vibe where yeah. like, I'm the Ric Flair and I'm bringing this title back in. Even though this title is a real title, I actually never won it. I just saw it in the office and picked it up. And me being a dick, dickhead, I'm, not, I'm the greatest champion of all time. But And um, I, I, I think that definitely helped with my character development because um, it was one of those things where, like, I bring this fake title back that I never wrestled for. I never won it. But then on social media, and when you, um, you talk to the fans on it, they really think I'm the real world champion, but I never won it. So it was like, you guys, it, it was it was so fun to see how some fans actually believed in me and believed me when I said I was a real champion. They would say, yeah, he is a real champion. He's Mr. Impact Wrestling. He should have a champion. Yeah. And, the and, and that, that definitely, that whole storyline definitely um, helped with my development and my momentum. Yeah. I think your promos have gotten so, so good over the time that you've been in Impact Wrestling. And I'm, I'm really curious to know, did someone specifically help you with your promos or did you start to study something or do something to make yourself get better? Um, a few people helped me with promos. Um, first of all, a lot of people don't know this. Um, I think Jimmy Jacobs probably has one of the best promos in wrestling so i think with him working with impact wrestling it helps out everybody because he is a ball of knowledge walking around like sometimes you think he's a psychopath but with him being a psychopath because his mind is always thinking his mind is always all over the place he's a genius and he has yeah. definitely a lot with it and i hate to give this guy props because every time chance this guy has he buries me but Don Callis, before he left, was definitely an instrumental in the, the development of me. And um, he made cutting promos so easy because some of the things he would tell me. And um, I know this character um, I, I, I'm, I'm playing now, this Moose character, um, I remember having a conversation with Don when we was thinking about how to to present this character and he told me about have you ever watched um no country for old man the the assassin in that movie how he doesn't really he's really monotone and doesn't really show any emotion and he doesn't laugh he's not pissed he you, you don't know when he's happy. he shows the same emotion when he's happy with when he's pissed yeah. and you really I remember Don bringing that up to me. He was like, maybe this new character should be more like this. So when you cut your promos, you should never yell or you should never be sad or you should never be angry. You should just be always monotone. Mm -hmm. And I thought, about, I was like, man, this would probably be very hard to do. And I started, I, I went home and started practicing it. And it was actually easy. It was like, and the monotone promo is the easiest promo ever. Because like you're not showing, you're not really giving any emotion. Like people don't know how to read you. They don't know if you're pissed, if they don't know if you're angry. But one thing they do know is you look like a killer because you're not giving them anything. And I played with it for a while. I did it? Did some promos in front of my wife, and she was like, 
yeah, like you just talking, but for some reason you look like you're menacing when you talk that way. And I was like, that's the, that's what that's what I'm going for. I want to look menacing. I don't want to. I don't want people to be like, oh, he's pissed, or oh, he's happy right now, or oh, I can read him. I, I don't want people to be able to read me at this character. I just want to be able to talk, and nobody could read what emotion is going through my head because they just are scared, you know. And so thanks, shout out to Don Callis for helping with that. And definitely a big shout out to Jimmy because he definitely showed me ways to not only stay monotone, but to show some emotion without showing a lot of emotion. You know yeah. what I'm saying? Yeah. Which match would you say you're most proud of in Impact Wrestling? Oh man, that's hard because it's a it's a lot of matches, man. Um I'll tell you a few that okay. I, I can't tell you what match I'm most proud of because there's so many matches and sometimes it might not be that long 30 minute match that you would pick. It could be like a five, six minute match that I did something different or I, I, I did something that um, I've had issues with and I actually fixed it. So, uh, so to answer that question, what match am I most proud of is kind of hard, but I do know one few, a few, um, that I'm very proud of. I would say it's, it's two of them. Um, my long year feud with Eddie Edwards, um, that definitely brought out a side of me and uh, with wrestling that I think that was a match that made me understand what wrestling really is. Coming from a guy who used to be a spot monkey and just wanted to do cool stuff and do cool flips and do all these cool things and think about what spots should we do and what spots um, what spots could we do that would be cool. And that feud with Eddie taught me more about being a storyteller, mm. about story to tell instead of what spots to run, you know what I'm saying? Um, and so that was definitely very instrumental um, in my develop development. And somebody else, just recently, my mini feud with Chris Saban. Um, that, because Chris Saban, I think he's, somebody actually asked me this question in a podcast I did earlier. If you was to pick a Mount Rushmore for Impact Wrestling, who would it be? And Oh, now we need to hear this. Oh, oh, oh we'll get into that right okay. after I say this. So they asked me that question, and I was like, man, um, Chris Saban has to be in there because he, he's such a, a underrated wrestler that people don't give him the credit that he deserves because he's one of the best wrestlers in the world, but he's so quiet and so humble and doesn't put himself out there that fans don't don't put his name in the list because he's not so outspoken, you know what I'm saying? But yeah, my, my feud with him definitely helped because um, he taught me a lot of things um, that... I still use to this day after our feud with him, you know what I'm saying? But yeah, um, somebody asked me this question about if I was to name my Impact Mount Rushmore, who would be So is it. this a TNA slash Impact Wrestling Mount Rushmore? Yeah, uh, I mean, okay. the company is still, it's TNA. It's, ever, it's always going to be known as TNA. You can't, you can't say Impact Wrestling and just forget about TNA because the company yeah. was for TNA. Um, and it was hard. It was, it was hard because... My, I, I picked my original four and then I kind of switched it, but I did it. So my original four was Asia. Cause, okay, so this is the thing. When I'm picking my Mount Rushmore, I'm not going to pick people who made, them name, made their names somewhere else. So with that being said, Jeff Jarrett, even though he created a company with his own money, and probably should be in the Mount Rushmore. Um, I'm not going to pick him because yeah. he made himself in another company. He didn't make himself at TNA. You know what I'm saying? He was already a superstar in WWE and WCW, and then yeah. created. A, but he should be. Oh, I mean, obviously, he should be number one because without him, it wouldn't oh, be a TNA. Right. Uh, but that was for me. My standpoint was I'm not going to pick anybody that made a name outside of TNA. So that removed. Okay. Oh man, I'm so curious who's on this. Yeah. That removes Jeff Jarrett. That removes Kurt Angle. It removes, it removes Jeff Hardy, Angle, Matt Hardy. Hardy, all the Hardy. So I was going to only name guys who made themselves 
in TNA. Okay. That removed Joe, um, Samoa Joe as well because Samoa Joe made his name in Ring of Honor. And when he signed the TNA, that's when it was a big deal that TNA signed this guy, Samoa Joe. So he didn't make my... Oh, wow. Okay. So my four is AJ Styles. Of course. Gail Kim. Mm-hmm. Eric Young. Uh-huh. Raven. Oh, wow. And if I could pick a fifth person, which probably should be the first person who would be in the Mount Rushmore would be Abyss. Oh, Abyss yeah. Abyss. What about Daniels? And, uh, and that's, an, that's another thing. That's a hard one, too. Daniels should 100% be in it. Like, <laughs> Kazarian should be 100% be in it. But it's like Bobby Roode, EC3, all these guys. <laughs> But for me, if you're looking at accomplishments, um, you have to put EY because he's like the Shawn Michaels of TNA. He's literally won every single title yeah. in the history. So you have to put him in there, right? Yeah. Uh, Chris Saban, same thing. He's literally won every single title in the company's history and also has won the X Division title more than anybody in the company's history. So you have to put him in there too, right? If you're talking about accomplishments. Um and crazy to think Christopher Daniels never had the world championship in Impact Wrestling. And that's and that's what I thought about. I was like, man, Chris Christopher Daniels with all the epic matches he had with AJ Styles. But if you're talking about accomplishments, he never he won the put, he was putting so many people over though. Right. He never won the world title, though. So that's the thing. Um, same thing. I mean, Bobby Roode, like Bobby Roode had was a great tag team wrestler, won a lot of won the tag team championships a few times, but never won the exhibition championship. Um, like, um, and then he didn't have a really long run as the guy at TNA. He did, but he didn't. Um, so for so, me, so hold on. What do you what do you need to do? to you know throughout the rest of your impact wrestling career to be one of those faces up there um i mean obviously I, there's, there's i've only i've been here what for six years now um still haven't technically won the i haven't done anything if you think about it um i'm like one of those guys that if you mention impact wrestling now i'm probably one of the first names that come up that you think about but if you really think about it i haven't really done anything it's just off of it's off of looking scary and well, yeah, but you're also a guy who doesn't need championships to get yourself over. Right. And that's, and that's one of those, I think right now is a different, it's a different um, era of professional wrestling where now you're in the era where certain guys don't need world titles to get themselves over. Like, and I feel like I'm, I mean, when I'm in that class where like, I'm such a, and I hate to say this, guy, I'm, I, I'm, I proud of myself on being humble, but I'm such a big guy and such a, a presence that like people are going to remember me regardless of if I have a world title or not. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, so, I mean, you know, you don't need to say that. It's something that we're all thinking and we know. Right. right. So I appreciate that. So, um, so, but if you think about it, like I haven't really done anything at Impact. I've been there for six years now and I really having i mean i, I won, know i mean that's that's I not true championship that josh matthews also won so i mean is that really a big deal like you know what i'm saying so i mean at the great if you're looking at on stuff that you will read on paper i don't i i haven't really done anything more of the stuff i've done is for fans who actually watch the product and be like oh man that's a moose was a huge presence in impact wrestling but if you was to look at my stats on paper yeah I, I mean you wouldn't be impressed at all <laughs> well if we bring this full circle to how this conversation started you look more like a champion now than you ever have in your career appreciate it yeah and that's one positive i took took with covid was to work on the way i look and i mean there's obviously covid affects everybody in this world i mean it sucked but um one thing I told myself I was gonna do, I was gonna find one thing to, to one positive thing to take out of COVID and working on the way I looked and working on my body and um, working on my skills in the ring was something I was gonna do. Cause I had, 
I couldn't do anything else. Well, I think that these accomplishments you're talking about, these championships, maybe it begins. Maybe it begins at Bound for Glory. Yeah, I mean, that's what the plan is. And then I think as we look towards the end of this year and then into next year, I bet if we had this same conversation next October, it might be a little bit different. Yeah, I mean, I'm hoping. I mean, my I made a promise when we started back um, shows um, after COVID in an empty arena, but that I would be world champion by 2021. So um, I know Bound for Glory is the last pay-per-view of the year. And if I don't get it done by Bound for Glory, there's still... We still have two more months before the end of the year, three more months before they ever get to get that goal to fruition. But uh, I mean, I, I think Bound for Glory will be a good start yeah. to try. I, uh, I, I've really enjoyed this deep dive into your career and into your life. And I think that a lot of people are gonna be really inspired by this, whether their goal is to be a pro football player or a pro wrestler or whatever it is that they're chasing after. I think that the thing that's so great about your story is this idea of you're never too big to start over again. Yeah, definitely not. Like, I mean, and I'm a living proof of that. I mean, I went from a guy making so much money to starting over in professional wrestling, making literally nothing losing money paying miles paying to go wrestle yeah. <laughs> you know and so and it, it, i would i would love to say it was humbling because it wasn't because i loved it <laughs> humbling something you do something and you hate that you're doing it, and you're learning a lesson from doing it it wasn't even humbling to me because i loved it like <laughs> loved being in the car for 12 hours driving to Chicago to wrestle in front of 300 people because I wanted to be a professional wrestler. And I was so excited to get there. And after wrestling that 12 minutes driving back, I was I still had the adrenaline rushing in my body for at least the first five hours of the ride until I pulled over and got a hotel. Because <laughs> I was about to kill myself from like sleeping on the road. Uh, but I loved it. It wasn't a humbling experience. It was a uh, I felt in love and still in love with professional wrestling experience that I would yeah. do that. And I, your passion just like oozes through the screen. I, I love this so much. Uh, I end every interview with the same question talking about gratitude, because for me, I start and end every day saying out loud three things that I'm grateful for. And I really think it sets the tone for you. So what are three things that you're grateful for in your life right now? Um, three things. Um, definitely my wife, um, cause with this lifestyle that we live and always being on the road and always catching flights and she is perfect in the sense that she supports me through it all. She doesn't complain. Um, it's been times where we've made plans to do something and last minute I get a book in and I have to cancel it. and she understands because she knows that this is what I love to do. And then she helps me out with everything. And there'll be times where she will leave little surprises in my bag and or candy or a card or something that I forgot that I wasn't thinking of and she'll put it in there and write a note. Um, so I'll say her first mm -hmm. because she is a blessing. Uh, my 11 year old son, because I do this part for him. Um, hopefully to show uh, to build build up build up enough in the, of a legacy um, that whenever I leave this earth, he could look at it and be like, "Man, my dad did this, 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 this all for me." Um, and the third thing, third thing is, um, and this might be more selfish, is for myself um, because as a kid, um, this is what I wanted to do. So me waking up every day and getting the opportunity to live a life that I dreamed about living as a kid, it's awesome. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So, yeah. You're, I mean, you're living proof that literally anything is possible if you're willing to work hard enough. Right. Yeah. Moose, I guess I should do this. Moose, thank you so much. It's been such a pleasure to catch up with you. Oh, thanks, man. I hope to see you in Vegas, Bound for Glory. I Definitely be there. I mean, I, I'm booked on the show, so I have to be there. Well, so. of course you're going to be there. Yeah. yeah. And you, you know, and you, you and hopefully you're leaving 2021 with some gold around your waist. 
hopefully I'm leaving Bountiful Glory with some going around my way. That's the that's the goal. So, but we'll see. Hopefully I'll see you there. Thank you so much. Thanks.